I don't think that this Formula One driver can recover from this. And honestly, at this point, I just want both he and Williams to make it stop. Please, it's just ridiculous. In fact, this is giving me a modern twist of something that happened back in the early 90s. What I am seeing going on with Logan Sargent at Williams is just getting more and more depressing. Unlike other content creators who are immediately going for the jugular and ripping Logan to shreds solely, I think a lot of this stems from something that I saw with Oscar Piastri when he got picked by McLaren, and when Gunther Steiner chose violence regarding Mick Schumacher. A team wanting you, above all others, matters. Right now, I don't think Logan has that. Williams no longer want the guy. And even though there are platitudes spread across the media, it just doesn't seem genuine. It seems just fake. Because when James says one thing, he says more things about Carlos Sainz. And that's not happening until next year. Look, James, stop. You've already got Logan to peace out for 2025. What more do you want? In fact, all of this is making me think of the antics of a team from the 1990s with a somewhat similar situation. Now, granted, how Andrea Molda treated Perry McCarthy and its disreputable conduct is not what Williams is doing. For the full story about that, you can check out Josh Revel's video about them here. But the similarities that I am seeing are enough to make my eyebrows twitch upward. It's quite clear that the team boss of Williams and the team itself wants to move on from the troubled times that it's had in the last couple of years or so. And they're able to find it with getting Carlos Sainz, partnering up with Alex Albon, and then having the most solid lineup it's had in probably nearly 20 years or something. And right now, they are not really paying much attention to the likes of the driver that they already have. One, might I point out, that comes from their very own academy. Now, for some context, the boss of Andrea Moda back in 1992 hired a driver named Perry McCarthy. But it became clear that shortly after that relationship began, the team's boss, Andrea Sassetti, was no longer interested in him, wanted to replace him with the driver who came with a million dollar sponsorship, but the FIA swatted that away due to the team reaching their quota of drivers for the year. So therefore, cue the multiple acts of hijinks that either saw Perry McCarthy unable to race, his car breaking down on him, or maybe potentially sending him to the hospital. All of these antics are available for you to find out, and this was before social media happened. Can you imagine what would have happened if Andrea Mulder and Sassetti had access to Twitter? Fast forward to now, and I'm seeing something similar. Whilst I am impressed with Williams getting Carlos signs for 2025, and the signs are looking good for their recovery efforts, the conduct in which it's been manifested is incredibly messy, and the lip service is shocking. Yes, James Valls has been a positive influence for the Williams team, because even though Josh Capito did the best that he could, and his tenure wasn't meant to be a long-term solution, but more of a bandaging up of the team for it to then excel from there, it just feels like there have been many times where Williams have dropped the ball and all of the good work they have done in terms of public relations and rebuilding the team to make it more you know, adaptable for modern Formula One has been just completely squashed. And I know that James Valls has been trying to justify his position by saying that F1's a meritocracy and that you have to earn your spot for the following year in which to justify Logan's danger or security. I get that. But you also have to give them the best car possible and treat them well if you wish to extract their full potential. But in a way, that doesn't really seem to apply to Alex Albon because he's had his fair share of crashes throughout this year and last year. He's caused a lot of damage and racked up a very hefty repair bill for the team. Yet that doesn't really seem to matter as much because, you know, he's popular. He's experienced. He's scored them points. Yes. That's helped, but he has had his fair share of incidents, which Logan can be attributed to. And for the longest time, Alex had actually put more damage to the budget of Williams than Logan did. That was before, of course, the FP3 crash at the Dutch Grand Prix weekend, where that crash potentially racked up a $1.7 million repair bill. Yeesh! That's almost as bad as Checo's damage that he sustained at the beginning of the Monaco Grand Prix. Oof, dear. But hold up, we'll get to that crash in a second. Now, I've gone on about this in many videos, but the situation right now is increasingly saddening, which peaked in the driver press conference for the most recent race. In Logan's session with Yuki and George, the only question the former got was from the compare surrounding Carlos and Williams, not about him specifically. He got no interest from the press. In any case, the tone from Logan is that of a downbeat acceptance of his lot and an awareness of the public displays of affection that his team boss is giving to the guy who's replacing him. Which I find utterly ironic because that's exactly what's happened with Carlos and Lewis and Ferrari. So I guess this is Carlos just paying it forward in a way? 
but I think it's safe to say that the team is quite ready to remove Logan as quickly as possible, but they're trying to be nice about it, since Sergeant hasn't really given them any reason outside of the car to be cruel toward him. He seems like a nice guy, albeit a little bit on the shy side. And yes, I am fully aware about the potential hypocrisy about me wanting to really protect and defend Logan Sargent whilst trashing the likes of Lance Stroll. Both of them have connections to rich people and, you know, it sort of reeks of nepotism. But may I remind you, Logan Sargent is not attached to any sponsorship money. In fact, Williams don't need that sponsorship money. They made it clear that in 2022 that they didn't need Nicholas Latifi's Sofina money or anything like that. They were just keeping him on for a third year out of loyalty and a thank you for him sticking by them in their most troubled of times. But what really doesn't help is that for most of the time we see him, he casts a very quiet figure. And lastly, it gives very little for journalists to work with. And it goes against the European preconception that Americans are loud, brash and talkative and all they talk about are eagles and freedom. It's jarring, but in my mind, refreshing. Hey, if Logan wants to act the way he wants to act, then fair enough. If that's his genuine personality and he's just who he is, then okay, fine. And I'm just glad that he doesn't follow American stereotypes, like how I don't follow the British stereotype in that I don't drink tea. But okay, let's get to that crash. And don't worry, I'm not going to be glazing about it and thinking that Logan is completely untouchable because yeah, that crash was bad. It was unnecessary. It could have easily been avoided, but Logan's inexperience did really come home to roost. And what it illustrated is that Williams' car is still a tricky machine and Logan's still got a lot to learn, such as grass still being damp, even though the track is dry. The narrow nature of Zandvoort's first sector didn't help either, because if you make a mistake anywhere in that first sector, you are going into the wall just like how Daniel Ricciardo did the previous year and injured his hand. Now, at a typical track, this kind of incident, you might have gotten away with it because everything's so wide these days. Logan might have spun, but he might have just spun onto the grass. He might have been able to recover or maybe it might have stalled and you might need the recovery vehicle, but it wouldn't have red flagged the session. And maybe at worst, you might have gotten a damaged front wing, but you'd be able to get it back to the pits, just replace it, job done. No real quibbles, no real interruptions in terms of procedures and whatnot. But this crash totaled the car, and in such an extreme nature that the team couldn't get it ready for qualifying, and all of that valuable data gathering for all of these new upgrades was completely and utterly lost for not just Logan's car, but Alex's car as well. And yet, Logan started ahead of Albon anyway because of Williams' other mistake in their own upgraded floor not complying with the rules. It was so small, it wouldn't have made any difference in terms of performance, but the rules are rules. Williams did not take that into account. There was no contingency or discrepancies. It happened under their watch. So Williams, they're not completely free of mistakes either. They're still working on it. So this is why I don't get why Williams are so utterly critical about Logan. The team's going through changes. Logan's not going to be there next year, so you've already got what you wanted, James. Let him try and find himself in the next nine races because, yeah, he's gone. The consequences of that incident led to a firestorm from the media and the fans. Since it completely wrote off FP3 and lost Mercedes, you know, there's a big hint here, of especially vital running time in which to dial in the W15 some more. And that arguably led to their underperforming on Sunday, since the car's working window still requires a lot of setup time. So naturally, I can imagine that Toto wouldn't have been exactly pleased at his charge over at Williams. Yes, I am aware that Toto Wolff is no longer a major shareholder of that team, but I'm pretty sure that he would have their best interests in mind. Equally, the audience attending the weekend and the fans watching across the world would have lost even more time watching cars go by after a month break. People wanted more and they didn't get it. The headlines from outlets used were incredibly incendiary, and the picture of a burning Williams and Logan escaping that wreckage has now become notorious, and one that will haunt the team for the rest of the year, at least. Not until they actually turn themselves around and get back to the top of the midfield. Now, in my mind, this is going completely against the plan that James Vowles has in mind in order to try and restore the good image of Williams and are completely rid of any controversies or calamities. Saturday, uh, yeah, that wasn't a good day for them, not just with that crash, but also with Albon's disqualification from 8th on the grid. And don't forget, James, there's always Australia. What I reckon is that the end of James's tether was met in the ability to see their data gathering manifest itself on the track. 
Williams brought a major upgrade to the Dutch Grand Prix, the place last year where Albon scored an unlikely amount of points given that Williams' car is really known for having little downforce and this is a downforce heavy track, he kind of needed to do well, and yet he survived the storms of 2023 and got points anyway. So naturally the team thinks well if it happened once before with an inferior car it might happen again, so it's been a wild summer, let's bring the brand new parts here, let's see how it does. Oh Alex is doing alright, he's doing quite competently and then oh okay, here comes Logan and Oh, they're probably not so keen seeing it in pieces and that heap of now scrap being bandied about the internet. And I can't tell you how bad that can be to an organisation and how it will haunt them for ages. Now I hark back to an incident that happened with the old airline Pan American Airways, in which a Pan Am jet exploded over Scotland due to sabotage and parts of it came to rest in the fields around the town. One iconic photo remains to this day as a legacy of that event and it dogged the company all the way through to it closing its doors and now this photo of Logan, the car's on fire, it's in pieces, it caused millions of dollars of damage, yeah Williams is trying to rebuild itself and now it's been completely torn apart again. Oh, this year has not been good to them, seriously. Again, Australia, they really should have just allowed Alex to face the music, recognise his error and allow Logan to try and do his best anyway. That's what should have happened, but no. Alex was then brought in to secure points, he didn't get points, so it was all for naught. So I don't think a photo of the child remains of Williams' major upgrade is something that Valve wants to see plastered around the internet. What would his darling Carlos think? Well, I mean, okay, Alex qualifying in 8th before the qualifying drop might have eased the pain and made Carlos just actually look, that looks good. But from the words of Vals, you can tell that he was mad. And a stats guy, when he's mad, he'll tell you in his own certain way. And believe me, I really like statistics in GCSE. Ahem. There's hundreds of hours spent on the update. It looks like it's working, but there's few of them in the world. Really, the worst time is when you've just introduced it with small amounts of bits and put it into the wall of the circuit. If something happens now to the other car, you need to make sure in Park Ferme you have enough spares. That's more what I want to evaluate now. When we're under Park Ferme conditions, can we service both cars to a sufficient standard? Does that mean, is my poor darling Alex okay to race tomorrow? And even though James went on in that article to defend Logan in his own way, talking about how he can bounce back from these kinds of incidents and reset for the following weekend, an element of Val's naivete as the team principal is that most media pundits, they don't care about that part. They care about the incident itself and the ramifications of it. You see, Val's still has got a lot to learn in terms of being a team boss. He really needs to be able to defend his drivers to the hilt, first and foremost, before talking about the consequences of their actions, because that's what journalists and content creators care about, that there is a Williams in the wall, it's on fire, it cost how much in damage? Oh, Logan, he bad! That, that's, that's, the, that's the narrative. And even though he's far less direct than Gunther Steiner was in relation to Mick Schumacher's own similar issues regarding crashing a lot and losing precious money toward development for Haas, the resulting damage to Sargent's reputation stands. And again, the naivete shows regarding talking about Carlos all the time and sort of running with the notion that he and science were dating almost, constantly talking about the stories surrounding their meetings like some awkward first date or something over a candlelight dinner. Stop! It's done now! I get it, James. You're a lovable dork sometimes, and you want to run with the idea that he and Carlos were these awkward lovers and they sort of courted each other through uncertain circumstances and fortuitous ones at that, but it's not funny anymore. You got the deal done. Just get on with the job of fixing the team, fixing your car, and figuring out a way to make the FW46 run like a proper car, because according to Alex Albon, it's still really sensitive to wind, and it's still troublesome when it comes to downforce at moments and at some circuits. And considering that Zandvoort is right by the sea, and there were gusts at some point up to 80 kilometers an hour, that's 50 miles an hour by the way, but now begs the question, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of you want to know what I think. What do they do now, Williams? Do they stick with Logan for the rest of the season regardless, just thinking, well, what's the point of changing things? Or do they take a punt and then decide to actually care about 2024 instead? Because by the way, James said he doesn't care about 2024. And they pick either Mick Schumacher or Liam Lawson because that seems to be the party line, according to the media. As much as I would want Williams to keep Sargent around, I feel like all it would do is tear into his morale even more. 
especially if the car isn't with him and he has another accident, because the narrative will only get stronger. The sport seemingly doesn't want him, the fans seemingly don't want him, the team principal seemingly is indifferent to his plight, and even though he's providing some platitudes and lip service in the media, that kind of sentiment is utterly soul-destroying for anybody and can impede any progress made with private conversations, because if it doesn't match up in private to what you say in public, what's the point of even saying it? Much like how gushing over your drivers can see to it that your driver excels. And what really didn't help is that rumours spread, you remember those about a month or so ago, that James Viles and Logan Sargent were no longer on speaking terms. It just ran like wildfire and people just accepted it like it was truth. People didn't question it. Ultimately, it was disproved and it wasn't true. And this was one of the rare instances that Logan really stepped up, spoke up and clapped back hard. And I was thinking, good, Logan, you're fighting your own corner. Excellent. But at this point, I just really want Logan to speak up and just really talk about what's going on at Williams. Just really try and air out the dirty laundry, make it really clear about the struggles that he's facing. And if he chooses not to and decides to act with good grace and just take it on the chin, that he decides to move on with his career and just end it on his terms. If Williams aren't really going to be putting much effort into keeping him, and well, they're not going to be keeping him for next year, then he really needs to see about what he's going to be doing for next year, so that means his dreams of motorsport continue on. Maybe go back to IndyCar, which is what he was originally going to do before Williams called him up for the Driver Academy. At this point, Logan really needs to start taking charge and forging his own destiny for next year. Take control about his future. If he scores points, then fantastic. But I don't think the media will care all that much anyway. They're more interested about who's going to replace him. Is it Mick Schumacher? Liam Lawson? Liam especially is getting a lot of attention considering all the drama going around at Red Bull. Both men are free agents, a mixed profile picture and description on Instagram has been wiped clean of any team affiliation, which is causing some interest, while also Red Bull has started to be more open to the idea of loaning Liam out, even though Helmut Marko previously said that that wouldn't happen. But I do think that this is probably not going to happen. For starters, we've got to remember to last year when Liam Lawson was the talk of the town, and he was, in F1, showing exactly what he could do. But when the talk surrounded about him potentially going to Williams to replace Logan last year, he effectively snubbed it, saying that he was a Red Bull driver and he would then do the business at a Red Bull team. But maybe now that plan might not come to fruition, he might be a little bit more open to going to Williams for the rest of the season to show people what he could do, especially since he can't do FP1 sessions because he's already gone above the allocated amount that you can for an FP1 session for a junior driver. But either way, there are just many things stacked against it, even though Williams are holding talks with Red Bull, reports coming out that these talks are stalling simply for the fact that Christian Horner's effectively being difficult again. And it's going against completely what Horner said earlier in the week, that he was open to the idea of him being loaned out. But now there's a condition that Red Bull could call him back at any moment without any warning. Either that's to retain some sort of control in their driver lineup, or maybe there's a move regarding Checker later in the year that might be happening, and if he's stuck with the team, they might not be able to do it. And also, I don't think Toto would really like the sound of this, because remember what happened with Alex when he came to Williams on loan from Red Bull? Toto had an absolute meltdown regarding Alex being there, because he thought he was a Red Bull spy, thinking he would spy on what's going on with the Mercedes power unit and report back to Milton Keynes. He only agreed with Alex going there if he cut ties with Red Bull completely, Christian Horner did do that, to be fair, to ensure that Alex got back on the grid. But even then, it was still a really complicated situation. And Liam Lawson, he's even more ingrained with Red Bull. So what's stopping Toto from having another meltdown again and complicating the talks on his own end? That kind of uncertainty is not what James needs right now when he's having uncertain thoughts about the driver he's already got. And also, most importantly, and what we saw with team playedness and commitment and Esteban Ocon, Williams wants a committed driver. James wants a committed driver. He wants a driver, if Logan's going to be replaced, who will stay out the course for the rest of the season to build a good enough relationship and a good enough dynamic come the end of the season. He doesn't want a driver who could then bounce at any moment. He wants Liam Lawson to effectively have a commitment ring on. Yeah, we're giving back to the illusions of dating and Carlos and stuff like that. He wants somebody who will settle down with him, raise a family, buy a house in the country. But it's okay, James. Carlos won't let you down because Carlos is bae. Then there's Mick Schumacher. Even though Mick is closely linked to Mercedes, and he is a reserve driver available to all Mercedes-powered teams, bar Aston Martin should he be required, Valls has had reservations of his own regarding the matter, when he snubbed Toto's advances regarding Mick for 2024, saying the data just didn't data. Now, things might have changed somewhat over 2024, 
with Mick Schumacher's antics over at Alpine in the World Endurance Championship, Alpine really raising his team spirit, his work ethic, and the fact he's actually one of their faster drivers, and he really can hold his own in that department. But the problem is, is of course, the World Endurance Championship. Alpine really count on Mick. He is carrying the number 36 car. There are two races coming up in the World Endurance Championship that are happening at the same time as the Italian Grand Prix and the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. So Mick's going to have to make a decision. Does he stay at Alpine for these two teams or does he take up the call to get back into F1? Yes, of course. Mick wants to get back into F1 and prove people wrong about what happened at Haas and try and correct the mistakes of what Gunther had manifested. But the fact is, though, is that he is going to be torn. Toto will do everything he can, of course. Sebastian Vettel has come out to support him. But the fact is, though, is that he is enjoying his time in World Endurance and he might want to show commitment there. And if he's dropped, then Mercedes are just guilty of what Red Bull are doing with Lawson potentially at Williams. It's a bit complicated. It's not entirely practical. I mean, if it did happen, it would be a nice audition potentially for him to go to Salba for 2025, which is being lined up, and Mattia Bonotto is in charge there, and he did rate Mick Schumacher really highly while he was part of the Ferrari Driver Academy, and Mattia Bonotto was a team principal at Ferrari. But of course, they both departed in 2022 from that academy and that team and that association, but you never know. But even though you might be thinking I'm jumping for joy at Mick Schumacher being back in F1, I just, I just don't see this working out, you know? And... I don't want it to happen like this. Whoa, 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 hang on, Law. Aren't you being a little bit hypocritical here? You talk about Checo being replaced mid-season, and yet you don't want Logan to have the same ordeal happen to him. Look, I get that, but the stakes are vastly different here. Put simply, it's down to what the stakes are regarding these teams. For Williams, there isn't exactly much on the line. Unless Williams has a huge uptick in performance and Alpine falls flat again, Williams isn't really going to do much better than ninth place in the constructors. Sure, getting in a brand new driver might reduce the repair bill. But the fact is, though, the repair bill is already there. They've already got to deal with it. And who's to say that Logan Sargent might not be able to turn it around and provide some good results, not crash the car, and most importantly, just be a good driver and continuity and stability, which seems to be the watchword these days. Whereas Red Bull stand to lose out a lot of prize money as a result of McLaren and maybe even Ferrari or Mercedes catching up as well as the lost money from not getting the constructor's victory to boot. Sure, he has a lot of sponsors to cushion the blow, but it's still a major loss of pride for the team. Not to mention the whole situation at Red Bull is just utterly baffling. They have plenty of options in terms of drivers, and they're completely going against the modus operandi, which has actually kept them going for the last 20 years or so. Forever Rebel being the party team, the rebellious team, the renegades, going after the established teams like Ferrari and now Mercedes. Well, now they've become the establishment. They've become cushy. They've become conservative. They're not taking risks, whereas Williams, there is no risk. They're changing, they're evolving. They're not the Williams that they used to be. They're now a brand new Williams. So they're in a state of flux right now. So what's the point of getting rid of Logan right now when Bowles has again said he didn't care about 2024, he could let it go hang for as far as he was concerned. He's focused on 2025, then 26, 27. That's where he's looking at, not the actual here and now. Sure, as much as I would like to see Mick and Liam get a chance to impress the world again, there are plenty of things standing in the way of it happening, which wouldn't be ideal for Williams, since both drivers have some sort of drawback or commitment that needs sorting out first. And Monza is this weekend. They have little time to make this work. So I reckon it's just probably for the best for Logan to keep his seat, and the team seriously needs to improve how they handle him, and actually give him the confidence that he needs to make him realise that he's wanted, to stop all the talk regarding Carlos, just stop it. Come to the fore regarding your driver, defend him more, provide him the tools, help him set up the car, give him as much as he can to try and recover all of the damage that has been caused throughout the last 18 months or so. They need to do that just for these last couple of months. Then they can be shot of him. Then they can move on. Right now, they should just stick to what they've got. And I know, I want Mick Schumacher in that car, but I know that's not fair. So I gotta deal with it. Because even though Lance Stroll is guilty of similar things and people really dog on him even more so, he at least has a team principal that will defend him to the ends of the world. So alternatively, I would just like Logan to start his revenge arc and go and win the Indy 500 or something like that with Prema. Because they are headed Prema toward IndyCar next year and one of their standout talents from 2020 in F3 might be a star hiring to help them start off their path there in a Marcus Ericsson-esque revenge arc. And if you'd like to find out more about why I think Logan and Prema would be a good fit for one another, you can go and watch this video next and I think it's a real interesting fit and a good prosperous start to the next phase of Logan's career.